Okay, so the low-E glass can actually prevent um, the fading of window treatments, carpets, walls, and furniture. Now, skylights are actually a very interesting thing. It used to be that the biggest mistake you could do in construction is to put a skylight into a building. Okay, um, they leaked, especially like the skylights that were installed in the 80s and the early 90s, all around the sides here they would leak, okay? And if you had snow accumulation on top of these, which in the northern part of the country you do, okay, it got even worse. The ice would build up. It would push the um, skylight, these, all these joints between the building materials. It would push them open. And skylights, you could always see you had a skylight because there was mold and mildew all over in this area here, discoloration from water and everything else like that. Over time, skylights have actually gotten better. And I'm at the point now where if I had to build a house from scratch lately, I would actually think about putting skylights in a building if I had a vaulted ceiling in like a great room or something like that. Because they have the ability to open it. And if you tie, if you spend a little bit more money on the skylights, you can tie them into your building control system and you can actually cause these skylights to open, like if it's cooler outside than inside, and if the humidity is low enough, you can use natural ventilation to replace a lot of your cooling. Because if you have a skylight on a top floor at a hot, or a high point in your building, like you would see in a, like a residential house with a great room, you put a skylight in there, okay, on a, on a nice cool spring day where we still have low humidity, and my inside is heating up because of the sun, but it's still relatively cool outside, I can open these skylights, and I can open a window down near the floor level or an air intake, and I can allow the natural pattern of air, remember, hot air rises, the cool air from the window replaces it, and I can actually ventilate a house by using these skylights in the right way. So I'm actually becoming a more of a fan of skylights over the years. Okay, so again, we can provide light and we can provide ventilation. And as long as they're installed properly, okay, you can actually, these don't leak anymore. They've gotten much better with the leakage. Now, the other thing, though, is we need to talk about the physical size of the skylights. Okay, yes, it gives us great sunlight, awesome sunlight, but it can also affect the temperature of the space below. What I'm talking about is if, I, if my skylight is on a south-facing roof, okay, I'm going to get a lot of direct sun coming into that area. So if I'm thinking that I'm going to have a skylight on a south-facing roof, I have to probably have a ton of additional air conditioning, literally a ton of additional air conditioning, to make up for the cooling that's going to be required for that sun coming in in peak summertime. Also, just as a word of um, advice, never put anything into a south-facing roof like a skylight. Does anybody know, other than heat load, why I'm saying that? Why don't you want to put anything on a south-facing roof? That's where the sun beats up the most. Yeah, but there, there's a specific reason why a south-facing roof you'd want to put as little as you can possibly put in terms of roof penetrations on that south-facing roof mm. what about solar panels if somebody in the future is going to install solar panels what roof are they going to go on the south side yeah so if you as a builder if you as someone doing remodeling put a skylight on a south-facing roof you are really going to mess up the homeowner's possibility of installing solar panels on that roof in the future. Um, I know my south-facing roof is broken up into several, into several layers, and it was a pain to install solar on that, on that roof. It took a lot of figuring out where to put the panels rather than having the wide open roof. So I, I think it's sort of important to keep in mind. And this also, that comment also applies to if you're putting in a furnace and you need to make a roof penetration or a water heater for a vent for the um, exhaust, 
Um, don't put it on a south-facing roof because, again, more and more with the rebates that are available, with the energy consciousness of a lot of our homeowners, um, if we can put in solar, you're going to. Um, it makes sense. I like getting money back from the power company every month rather than paying it. So, I mean, a lot of people feel the same way. So um, don't mess up a south-facing roof. When you're taking a look at skylight sizing, you should never have it more than 5% of the floor area in rooms with a lot of windows and no more than 15% of the room's total floor area with spaces with few windows. In other words, builders should not go crazy with skylights. And if you're a homeowner doing a remodeling or if you're involved in a remodeling, if you start going over these numbers, the excessive solar load on these rooms is going to make a really, really big difference with um, your air conditioning and your heating. So just just be careful about the percentage of skylights to floor area. Now, 5%, if you have a room that's 200 square feet, I mean, 5%, that's not a very, that's not an unreasonable number. So it sort of makes sense. Um, where I do see a lot of these used skylights, if you're in a condo, okay, if you buy a condo someplace, and if you have, if your um, condo is the center of, like, if you have a, if you buy a condo here, this is yours, and if you have two other condos abutted up to each side of you, okay, like in a triplex or something like that, okay, this is not yours, okay, so you're in the center here, you really don't have a lot of space for windows. So if you're able to put skylights into a condo like this, it actually makes it feel much more wide open. And the resale value seems to go up on those. But again, from the HVAC technician's point, we want to make sure that when you're, when you're looking at this, and if for some reason someone's heating and air conditioning isn't working right, especially air conditioning, and you walk into this space and you see tons of skylights on a south-facing roof, one of the most valid questions you can ask is, hey, just curious, when did those skylights get installed? Because they might not have been original, and if, it wasn't, and if the system wasn't updated when the skylights were put in, the system may not be able to handle the load. That's part of why we do this course is so you can identify issues when you walk into a building doing troubleshooting. You can say, wait a sec, those skylights were not part of the load, okay? So it's important to realize and look around for stuff like this. You're not just fixing the box in the basement or the attic, okay? I'm not going to go through this exercise, but again, maximum recommendation would be 5%. So you take your room area, so 120 feet, 120 square feet for the top one, with many windows, 5%, with few windows, 15%, okay? And you come up with basically areas with many windows, 6%, few windows, eight or 6 square feet of skylight you can have, few windows, you can have 18 square feet of skylight. If you go up much over this, you're going to have problems with heating and cooling. Okay, and if these are on a south-faced roof, you might as well give up, add about a couple tons of cooling to the system because that's what it's going to take. As I keep saying, direction of skylight matters, okay? So for if they're facing north, okay, it's going to be a fairly constant heat load. North-facing skylights by far are the best, okay? You're not going to put a lot of solar radiation in. It may lose a little bit of heat just because of the cool illumination you have, but it's, it's, you won't get big changes of heat into the space, okay? East gives you the maximum light and solar heat gain in the morning. Remember, the sun comes up on the east. So if you're facing a skylight towards the east, you get the maximum light and solar heat gain in the morning. Very important. Okay. If you're facing west, you get afternoon sunlight and heat gain. Now, I would probably not, anything south and west, I probably wouldn't do. And when we start talking about why I say that, okay, it's because you're, um, 
your walls and everything are on the are pretty hot on the south and west sides of the house during the afternoon and evening and that solar gain is just going to it's going to really add to your um cooling bill might be very nice this might be great for heating only but if as soon as you get into cooling this is a bad idea south okay it's the greatest potential for desirable winter passive solar heat gain than any other location okay but it allows unwanted heat gain in the summer months so if I were installing a skylight up in let's say Vermont or New Hampshire or any of those southern states where we don't use much air conditioning okay I'd, I'd probably put it on the south side wouldn't have an issue with it but as soon as you get out of Vermont and down into the real world um, we start talking about air conditioning okay and in the south, south okay in the south climate zones I wouldn't put a skylight facing anything but north again because of solar gains now some people the other thing I wanted to just point out is that if you have a skylight okay and if it's by a tree okay so if you think oh I'm gonna break the Sun by putting the skylight here there's a tree outside what will eventually happen to that tree okay you're gonna eventually someone's gonna cut down that tree that tree's gonna get old that tree's gonna die okay leaves are gonna fall over the all over that skylight so sometimes installing a skylight and counting on a tree to shade it is not the best idea because if that tree goes there's about another 20 years before a tree is going to grow tall enough to provide that shade now these are really awesome um, I wish I had a better picture of this to show you guys but I really don't it's called a tubular daylighting device what it is it's actually it gives the same light capability as a skylight does but it doesn't give the heat load off of it as much okay so on your roof it looks just like a plastic dome up here okay and if you look down through that plastic dome all you see are mirrors okay this entire inside of this tube is a mirrored surface and it allows you to direct the light into spaces you want it so down here on the ceiling during the daylight hours there's a ton of light coming through it has a really it a, it's the equivalent light capability of probably 200 watts of light bulb on a nice sunny day so if you have a space in here that doesn't have a lot of windows like in an office building or an interior hallway of a house you can use this type of design it's it's basically a tubular device TDD it's referred to on plans but that light will bounce around in here and actually come down and light up the hallway or whatever room this is the entire time the day the in daylight basically Sun doesn't have to be beating on it um, we used a bunch of these in one of our campuses up in Rocky Hill Connecticut where we have a section of offices up there in the corporate offices that basically doesn't have any windows and it provided it also provides the occupants the people working in that area a sense of having some connection to the outside which is important for office workers so again these devices are awesome I've seen them worked and again it's a TDD you can buy them at Home Depot but they're great for interior spaces where you want to get light you want to get a some sort of feeling of outdoors but might not have light and from what I remember reading these tubes can go up to 25 feet without degrading the light here okay so there's a pretty big length that these tubes can go to they can't have sharp angles in other words you can't come down from the roof and do one of these and come across they have to have gradual bends okay because light doesn't do well coming around sharp 90 degree angles so anyone have any questions on skylights doors or sorry win and windows before I move on anything that came to mind as I was going through this okay 
We need to talk about doors because honestly, in residential, they provide their little bit of your heat load unless they're glass where they become a lot of your heat load and they're treated like windows. But um, doors in commercial buildings are probably one of the greatest sources of infiltration. Okay, in other words, air coming in and out. They're not a ton with just standing heat load, okay? But they, it's an infiltration problem, which means the uncontrolled movement of air in and out of a building. Okay, so Energy Star, which is more worried about residential construction, talks about a door being a sliding or swinging entry designed for and installed in a vertical wall separating conditioned and unconditioned space in a residential building. Okay, now this front door obviously is separating condition and unconditioned space okay because outside is unconditioned space now we have other doors in buildings that do the same thing if you have an unheated basement the door going from your kitchen down to your basement or hallway down to your basement that is considered according to energy star a door because it's separate it's separating the unconditioned space and the conditioned space garage doors going from a house hallway to a garage is considered a door okay because again you're separating your conditioned and your unconditioned space so that's what we're worried about with doors now do you show them on your blueprints and on your drawings for like bedrooms and stuff like that yeah you want to show the door even though I'm not worried about it for heat load but I am worried about it for air distribution that's where your interior doors come into place is more air distribution but from a heat load, from a total overall heat load, I'm worried about the doors that are separating the conditioned and unconditioned space. So we have three categories of doors. We have opaque that with no glazing. By the way, the word glazing as you go through this is windows. We have the opaque doors, no glazing. Okay, the little hobbit door, no window there. Okay, we have um the half inch light okay basically it's under i don't know how they came up with this number the 29.8 nor do i really care but basically say under 30 percent of it is window okay in other words very little window area under 30 percent of it is window and then we have the um greater than half light which is basically over 30 percent of it is window area so those are your three categories of doors, and they're treated different ways in your heat loads. Wood provides an approximate R value equal to its thickness in inches. Okay, in other words, if the door is two inch thick, it would have an R value of approximately two inches. Now be very careful with this. Okay, I'm going to click back two slides. Okay, because this is sort of important. Um, if you are looking at this door here, okay, you have to make, before you think it's a totally wood door, you have to look at it from the side. Okay, and you might have to tap on it with something like a metal screwdriver gently or something like that to see, is it totally wood? Or is it wood with insulation sandwiched between it? makes a very big difference okay this door looks like it's probably wood because I'll bet the same patterns are right on the back side of it and it's probably extremely heavy which means it's probably wood okay this door going into somebody's hobbit house here is probably wood okay this door has sort of a more pre-manufactured look okay they've gone for the wood look but if you look at it from the side you may be able to see that it's actually two pieces of wood sandwiched together. So, I mean, I have my wood here. I have my wood here. Okay, my wood finish. But between the wood, there's insulation, okay, through the center. Makes a big difference. So, when we're talking about the wood providing an R value equal to its thickness of inches, we have to talk about the two-inch thick door would have an R value of 2 if it is totally wood. Be careful of that. 
in northern climate areas, doors or entryway systems are required by building code to have an R value of 2.5 or more. So in other words, that two inch thick wood door may not be legal in northern climates in new construction or remodels unless you have insulation in the center of it. Does anybody have any questions on this? Because this does affect your area. I was just thinking on a lot of old doors, like the first one you showed, the, all those panels, there's a lot of areas in the panel that are a l much thinner than the two inches of the actual door itself, too. Suppose you yeah. have to take that in. Well, yeah, and what I normally do with that, and when you look at the, when you look at the grand scheme of things, is you're not going to have um, a, an R value of two or two point five, okay, in the grand scheme of things, when you look at your heat load, isn't going to make a lot of difference. So when I look at a two inch thick door, that's the wood door, like the first one that I showed there, I may cut that R value down to one point five. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, because now is point five going to make a di big difference in the grand scheme of things? Probably not much, but it helps you stay on track. Yeah, just it it gives it shows that you took the time when a building official looks at it, which by the way you do have to submit manual J's now to get permits for air conditioning systems. Um, when you look at when you look at when the building official looks at this. Okay, they're going to say, okay, yeah, he knows what he's doing. He took the time to look at the different R values. That's why, I, that's why I'll estimate it down a little bit. Okay, but again, be careful on this one. Okay, you guys are in, a, you guys are in an area that's covered by the International Residential Code, IRC, that does require the higher value R values on doors. Okay, now nine out of ten times this is not a problem because most people have a door that's not a solid, well, it's a solid core door, but it's made of, um, it has foam in it these days. It has the um, foam insulation inside of it. Okay, um, in southern climates, okay, we use a solar heat gain number of 0.4 or less. Okay, again, where cooling loads are concerned. Now, again, lots of times way to resolve this whole problem is to throw a storm door over it that has tempered, that has the low E glass, and I solve the entire problem. But again, we, we're more worried in the southern climates about the cooling bill. And because where you folks are located, you are right on that line where I would be either worried about heating or cooling or both because your summers do get warm enough where cooling becomes a big concern. Entry doors. Okay, it's considered the curbside door, usually at the front of the house, leads into a foyer or a reception area. Okay, so when they consider entry doors, that's what that is. Eyebrow doors. Well, the shape of it sort of has, looks like an eyebrow. Okay, that's an official name of the door. It's the shape of an entry door with a gently curving arch on top, like that of an eyebrow. This becomes interesting because this glass area is taken into account in the heat loads. That's why this is here. This glass area gets taken into account. French hinge doors. It's a hinge door with wider styles. Styles are like this around the outside that surround the glass, okay, has rails inside, has styles, so a French door. Sliding entry doors, one or, interesting, a door with one or more manual operated panels that slides horizontally within a common frame. Your patio doors are like this, okay, they either open or closed individually or together or you have one. And a lot of them will actually tip out, like that little diagram showed there. They'll tip out, and you can actually pull them out of their tracks. Um, becoming very popular in high-end homes where they are trying to bring more of outside living inside, you might have an entire wall of um, these doors where the entire wall opens up. I don't know if anybody on here ever watches the Vanilla Ice Project, 
but he's, he uses these things all the time, where the entire house, basically, one wall opens up. Okay, it's considered a sliding entry door. Storm doors, most people know what these are, but um, if you have a situation where the existing door is old, still in good condition, or if you want to provide sunlight without having the house wide open, storm doors are awesome. Adding a storm door to a newer insulated door is not generally worth the expense. I sort of disagree with this statement, as it won't save much energy. Well, actually, it will, because on a, cold, on a cooler day, if the sun's hitting this, I can open up that inside door, and I can allow one-way penetration of sunlight into the house, and I can actually keep a room a little bit warmer because of the sunlight. So again, I, I don't necessarily agree with the base with that statement there, but it is what it is. Okay, so when we look at ratings of all of these doors and everything else like that, you can look these up online, okay? You can go to the NFRC, and that's that organization that I talked about that actually rates all these things. And their website is N. N is like a Nancy, FRC.org. And you can actually look up the different values for all of your, for all of the products that are rated. And I think they go back into the 80s. And you can find the R values, the U values. You can find the, some of the, the solar gain values. Okay, if for some reason something isn't on one of the tables that I gave you. This is where ACA gets its tables from. It's where ACA pulls its tables from. So the measure of heat loss, we've gone over this before. Okay, the measure of a rate of heat transmission through the material is the U value. The greater the thermal conductivity of the material, the faster heat passes through it when a standard temperature delta T is maintained. Delta T is my temperature difference. When the U value is doubled, the rate of heat transfer is cut in half. This is, again, a very important thing. If the U value is doubled, the rate of heat transfer is cut in half. Now that's not R value. What did I say about doubling the R value yesterday? What happens when you double an R value? Okay, the insulation capability drops. Every time you double the R value, that additional the additional insulation isn't as effective as the original R as the original layer of insulation. U values though are completely different. Once you double a U value, the rate of heat transfer is cut in half. So if the original construction is four inches thick with a U value of 0.13, and the new construction is eight inches thick with a U value of 0.06, that rate of heat is cut in half. Okay, so the thicker the U value, it can cut it in half. Area. This is where we start getting into. You guys have already started to work on this portion of your heat loss. Okay, and heat gain. Area. We're talking about the room total of surfaces. Okay, when I'm having you guys do the room-by-room room measurement, it's an interior measurement of your length and width, but you're also eventually going to need to get that net area of the walls. And again, we're worried about these outside walls. Okay, so you're going to be able to get two areas. You're going to be able to get your room-by-room room total of surfaces, and you're going to have a total of room when you add it all together when you add all your interior room areas, that gives you the area of the entire building. We also need to find the glass surface area. We need to find the net area. Okay, and then we need to find combination areas like the walls and stuff like that. This is all the steps that I'm taking you through. Steps one and two was the area of, step one was to come up with your floor plan so we can get the areas of all the rooms. Then step two was to come up with your surface area of the walls, the glass surface, the door surface, and the um, net wall area. All of that's important. Okay, step three 
is going to be to identify the materials we're using. Okay, step three is going to be you're going to take a look at, okay, what type of windows do you have in each area? Okay, is this triple pane, single pane? How does it fit into the U values? What's the appropriate U value? You're going to look at your doors like we just looked at. Is it wood? Is it solid core? Is it insulated? Does it have a storm door? Does it not have a storm door? Okay, all of this makes a difference. Then you're going to take a guess. Okay, and before anyone panics, okay, I know some of you rent, some of you are in areas where you can't look. I want you to take an educated guess of what the walls are made out of, how thick they are. That you can tell by a window ledge, how thick it is, or open up a door, and you can tell how thick that wall is. Okay, you're going to want to find out how thick the wall is. Does it have plaster on the inside? What's the, what does it have on the outside? Is there anything possibly in the center? Okay, some of you guys have basements. You can take a look at the basement and look up at an outside wall, and you can probably see that. Some of you who are um, comfortable doing it and be careful, you can pull a switch plate or an outlet cover and shine a flashlight in there and see what's in that wall. Again, if you're not comfortable, take a guess. Make an educated guess. You know you have sheetrock on the inside. You can tell from the door window thickness how thick that wall is. And you can look outside. Is it brick? Is it paneling? Is it, what is it? Okay, because we need to know that so we can come up with a U value of that wall. And this is not a perfect science. So people may look at a wall differently depending on how familiar you are with construction. Okay, but for the purpose of our project, that's what we're going to do, okay? Make, get as close as you possibly can, make an educated guess. Okay, areas, length times width, triangle, circle. Okay, we've actually talked about this when we talked about the basic math we did earlier. Okay, we gave, I gave you the different area formulas, and I think I actually gave you a handout that I had drawn up with the different formulas right on it. Okay, so again, we have plain walls. We have walls with rectangular windows and doors, and we have a plain wall with irregularly shaped ceiling, and we might have an irregularly shaped wall, cathedral ceilings. Okay, all of these are different ways you have to get areas. A room consists of four walls, a ceiling and a floor. We cannot forget about this. Two of these walls I may not care about. Okay, if the room's on a corner of a house, I don't care about the two inside walls. I care about the two outside walls. I care about ceiling, okay, only if it is on a top floor. Okay, so if you have a two-story house, I care about the ceilings of the second floor. Okay, if you have a two-story house and you're doing your first floor, I really don't care about the ceilings of that first floor in real life. In this exercise, if you're just doing your first floor, we're going to pretend the ceiling is the top of the house, okay, so we can get a good heat load. But if in real life, if you're just do, if you're doing two floors, I care about the ceiling of the second floor. First floor, the floor of a room, I care about the floor if it's over an unheated space. In other words, if it's the first floor over an unheated basement, I care about the floor. If it's the first floor over a crawl space, I care about the floor. If it's the first floor over... Um, just on slab on grade, I care about the floor. We talked about concrete yesterday. If it's the second floor, I don't care about the floor. Is it there? Yeah. But is it going to make a big difference in my heat load? No. Okay. So, again, we know room consists of four walls, a ceiling, and a floor, but do I really care about them all? No, not really. Not from a heat load perspective. Okay. Um, additions need to be talked about, okay? Additions. Okay, if someone wants to add a room on the back of a house, this is a very frequent question you're going to get as a heating and cooling technician. Uh, we're going to add a room. Can we use the same furnace? 
we're going to add a room. Can we use the same air conditioning? Well, that requires knowing what the heat load of the additional room is and knowing how you can run ductwork. So adding rooms. So if you have a house here, okay, and someone wants to add a what I call sort of a sun porch, okay, on the back here, but they want to have it cooled, okay, if your air conditioning system is over here, and if your ductwork comes out of the air conditioning and then branches out going down to two sides of the house, okay, you may be tempted to say, oh, yeah, no problem, ma'am. We, we can add a duct here and we can add a duct here to cool this area. But there's a very big, there's a couple big problems. One, how are you going to get the ductwork through the foundation? That's number one problem. Two, is there anything under this part of the house? Okay, because a lot of times add-ons are done with just slab on grade. So can you even get ductwork in there? And the bigger problem is, can this furnace or air conditioning system add the load of a sun porch? Sun porches are notorious for being surrounded by windows. Okay, very large cooling load. Okay, so most often... The answer has to be, no, your system cannot handle this. What could you suggest to a customer in this type of environment that would solve the problem? What could you suggest? Anybody, what would I suggest in this type of environment to a, to a customer who wants to add a sun porch? A mini split. I yeah, mini split is awesome because you know what you can get them at both as heat pumps and um, and cooling only. If I'm up in the far north, probably north of where you're at, more of the Albany, New York, Burlington, Vermont area, I there would be a boiler in the house anyways, and I'd probably say yeah, I can pipe baseboard heat for the heating because getting piping through there in a boiler that's zoned properly, it's not going to make a difference. They're all oversized anyways, nine out of ten times. But for the cooling, I'd put a ductless split in here. I wouldn't even attempt to duct it because it will never work right and the customer will always be unhappy. Okay, so determining the dimensions of a room. Well, if you have access to the building's blueprints, it's probably the best way to do it. Where can I get the blueprint for just about any house that was built in the last probably 20 years? Well, somewhere, right? I can find it usually online if your oh. building office is online, yeah, or I can go to the building office. The town has these prints on file from the original permits. I know when I, when I bought the house I'm in right now, um, the house is probably 13 years old or was at the time, 19 now, but um, when I bought the house I'm currently in, I had no blueprints. Okay, well, I was planning a redesign of the heating and cooling systems. And we were looking at putting in some other stuff, and I needed to know what was in the walls and what the original plans were because things weren't done to the original span, plan specification. So we pulled the blueprints. I went to the town hall, actually county offices here, and they actually printed a full set of plans for me. It cost me like three bucks. So it's, it's well worth getting the blueprints for the building as it was originally built. Okay, I found out that where the cooling system that they installed in the house wasn't even close to the system that was spec'd out in the blueprints. Thought that was interesting. Okay, you can find a chart with the dimensions. Okay, sometimes you can easily just get a chart from the builder of what the dimensions of each space were. By the way, this is going to be online with the real estate agents. This chart you can always get from the multiple listing from your, when your house was last sold. Okay, this is the one the real estate agents love. Oh yeah, we have a master bedroom that's this big. Okay, those, that's again, interior measurements. And then you can go, if you really feel like it, you can go measure it yourself for lack of better things. Do you I had you guys do the measurements for one simple reason. When you're in a customer's home or building, you're probably not going to have the blueprints and you're probably not going to have a chart. So you've got to be able to measure. And again, measurements aren't going to be exact, okay? 
because your wall dimensions, when you add all your interior measurements together, if you were to take and compare that to the outside, your measurements would be a little bit of the off because of the walls, okay? Most interior walls are two by four. So you're going to be two inches off or four inches off on those, add them together. Exterior walls, a lot of times are six or more inches thick. So again, you're going to be, you might be two feet off on your, if you compare your inside to your outside. Doesn't matter because I'm worried about inside space for my CFM. And once I add in my wall um, U values and everything else like that, you'll be fine. So again, inside measurements work the best. Okay, we've talked about blueprints and scales. Okay, most blueprints use a quarter inch equals a foot on a blueprint. It's easy to figure out. It's easy to remember. Just take, the, you lay a ruler down on a blueprint, divide it by four, that tells you how many feet the thing actually is, or multiply it by four, that tells you how many feet the thing is actually. So if your line is four inches long on the blueprint, it's 16 feet long in real life. Okay, it allows you to scale back a building well enough so you can get it onto a blueprint. Okay. If you have an architect scale, okay, it works really nice, three angled scale. I don't worry too much about those. I don't use a lot of times. If I look at a blueprint, that's a quarter inch equals a foot. It's just easier to figure it out. Until you get down to like six foot, eight inches, then it's always nice to have an architect scale. But most builders these days, you're going to find out that they have the measurements written right there anyways. So they make it nice for you on that. Okay. If you measure, if you measure a, um, arc with a ruler, if you measure a line, measurements eight and three quarter inches. Okay. You basically have 35 quarter inch pieces, or if you want to really break it down. Okay. Each piece is one, one foot. So your eight and three quarter inch line is 35 feet. Okay. Again, it's just easier to think of it. Leave the leave the leave this off. Leave the three quarter inch off of it. Okay. So if eight times four plus three. Okay. I'm not going to do these exercises because these are you've already done enough of these. I'm not going to worry about it. So I'm just going to click through these. Okay, you're going to see some abbreviations on blueprints. NTS is the most one, most often one you will see. It says not to scale. In other words, there should be a key someplace telling you those measurements. Okay, some other um, abbreviations you see, window schedule. It might have a note next to, um, might have a note next to a window. It says W3, just, that just means look at the window, item number three, that's what that window is. Same with the doors, it may say D6 instead of giving you the door measurement. You'll look at the door schedule, item number six. So again, there's some abbreviations that are used. Okay, front elevation shows you the, t shows you the outline of the building as you're looking at the front of the building, shows you what you're going to see. Side elevation looking from the side of the building. Again, we went over this with our blueprints earlier in this course. This is just a little bit of a review. Side of elevation. You're looking at the side of the blueprint. Top is the plan view. This is what you're drawing out right now, the top view. It's the plan view. Okay. This is a very busy one, has everything in the side, including electrical and stuff like that. We're not going that crazy. But again, just so you know, that's the plan view. If you add up the, what I was saying is if you add up the wall-to-wall -wall room measurements, you won't get the overall dimension of the exterior wall, okay, because of the wall. That's the indoor versus the outdoor. Okay, if the interior dimension of a bathroom here is six foot four inches, and the interior dimension of the bedroom is 13-1. Okay, so again, you have six four, 13-1, the two red circle. 
I still have wall dimensions. Okay? I still have these in these wall dimensions. So the wall dimension here okay might be four inches. And the wall dimension here could be six inches. So your inside and outside views are not going to be the same. Okay? So again, if I measure the outside of the house and get 36 inches from corner to corner, it's not going to equal the inside added up. Does everybody understand that? Is there any questions on that? Okay. You saw this on an outside wall, what will it be telling you? Foundation shift. Foundation shift. Okay, homeowner wants to move forward with their remodeling project anyways and you're having to come up with a heat load. What are you gonna what are you gonna take into account? Infiltration. What was that? Infiltration. Infiltration, yeah, you're going to have air blowing through here. So would I change my heat load to take that into account, or would I put a note on my heat load saying, hey, this has to be fixed? I'll put a note. It has to be fixed. Yeah, actually I would, because I'd want to have something that I've warned the customer that this is eventually going to be a water and mold problem. I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to adjust my heat load for that. That is that is the right answer because this is a health and safety issue. Not to mention I really don't like the foundation settling here. I'd probably that's one of those I'd put a note on my on my write up saying um yeah, we want to have a foundation specialist come in on this because there's some problems with the building going on here that could be a safety issue. Okay, in part of the, in like in my area here, if I saw this, I'd want to have someone come in and do a ground penetrating radar to see if they have, um, if we have a sinkhole starting. Okay, it's that serious of an issue. Houses settle over time, but they shouldn't be doing that. How would you handle measuring this turret, this area over here of the house? How would you deal with that? If you had to come up with an me area measurement of the outside wall of that, how would you handle that? Is it like a, like a half a circle? So would you find like the half, um, I'm sorry, the diameter of the rounded surface and then use that to determine your area? Yep, I'd find the, I'd find the diameter and then what I... What I want to do is I want to find, yeah, I'd take that area in half. I'd take an area of a circle with that diameter, and I'd cut it in half, okay? It's not going to be perfect because I have a suspicion that it's not totally in half. But then I'd, find, then I'd also use that diameter to find the circumference. Yeah, I was just going to say, and a lot of times it seems to be coming up with these cylinders what you really want is the surface area of it for the heat load, right? For the for the my exterior wall, I'm going to want the surface area. Yes, you are absolutely correct. However, uh, when we start half, go on, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I was going to say if it's a half a circle, you could use half circumference, but otherwise you could even realistically just string measure the distance of the wall that you have exposed and multiply that by the height. You are at, you are absolutely right on that. Now, that's for my heat load, for my wall area. Where, where you will need the inside area, actually, is when we talk about the airflow, your ductwork. Right. That makes sense. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's different ways to handle it. 
if I were doing this, because I'd probably be doing it from the inside after I just took a walk around the outside just to figure out where things are, I would probably inside just measure across where it starts going into at its widest point, and I'd probably use that number to come up with what my half my circumference is. Because I got to get that inside number anyways for area. But again, so many different ways. Okay, and this these newer style homes, especially when someone is when people are buying some of these, some of these are being built um, in these subdivisions. These are a total pain to get good measurements of because you have so many additions they've done for appearance only. Has no functional use, but it's for appearance. What are some of the things on this picture? And this is the type of construction you're going to find more in your area as well. What are some of the things on this picture that you're going to need to take into account for your load calculations? And no guess is wrong. All the winds, booze, and the peaks. Okay, I heard trees first. Yes. Yeah. The shading makes Shade. a difference. Okay, you said something about the peaks. Mm hmm Okay, the the overhangs are interesting. It's off it's, uh, okay. Can can I tell by the sunlight here what side of the house I'm looking at? It looks like a north view. Well, would the looking well, at the north side of the house, would no, I ever see the shadows and the sun? Yeah, the, the shadow over there, though, is like it could be. I don't know. Is that yeah. the west side we're looking at? Yeah. I'd actually. I I'm taking a wild guess here. I think we're probably looking at the south facing, and your sunlight is sort of it's in the afternoon, so it's sort of moving over to the west. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could be in the morning as well. But again, I'm looking at this. I'm looking at the south side of the house. I would never see direct sunlight on the north side of the house. Okay. What about um, what about a porch on a south side of a house? What's important about this? There's something pretty important about that with solar. It shades all the windows across the front which is nice yeah it provides that shading so when we're doing our heat load and I'm looking at these windows I'm gonna look on the chart that for the window has more than feel I think it's three feet or four feet of shading over it so it sort of is a window with an awning okay this over here what am I worried about on this side of this area of the house? I'm not just looking at the window. What's that area of the house? Garage. Yeah, it's a garage. Okay, now, I can't tell from this print, but would anyone in their right mind put this type of window facing into a garage? Probably not. So you can't see it on this picture. But that's probably an office that somebody built up abutting the garage. So, in other words, your garage probably starts there, and the front of that is an office. Is that office going to be a real problem to heat and cool? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so if I have heating and cooling problems in that office area there, I'm going to look at that insulation in that wall between the office area and the garage. A lot of times that's called a sort of a bonus room without it being a bonus room, okay, because a true bonus room would be like an extra room over the garage that somebody connected into the upstairs, okay, to up the square footage. But a lot of times the builders are like putting an office off to the side. It allows somebody to have a home office where you could actually run a company out of without being, and then because it's so separated, Okay, there's good separation here. You can actually take that portion of your mortgage and portion of utility costs that that home office would be, and you can, if you really want to tempt fate with the IRS, you can write that off. But um, so all of this stuff plays into account. Now, 
what are these right there? What's those little squares here? Are they basement windows? Yeah, they're basement windows. Does anybody remember what I said yesterday about uh, basement walls that are above grade? Do they have a different heat load than basement walls below grade? Yes. Yeah, they have a significantly different Four heat load. Grade. What was that? Do you put? Oh, I thought you said windows. I'm sorry. Well, I, when you see those windows there, okay, when you see those windows there, it tells you that there's a basement wall right. that's partially below grade. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing is, if this is this is a porch area, right? It's pretty. It's probably going to be, have at least a four or five foot porch area here, probably six based on the type of the house. You have steps going on. You have a porch. So is this basement area totally under the conditioned house? The basement ceiling, is it totally under conditioned space? No, not all of it. Yeah, because this porch area, you're going to have snow, um, rain, everything else hitting that porch area. This basement goes under the porch area. So I'm actually going to have to, if I'm heating and cooling that basement, I have to take that porch area as a roof for the basement area. So this heat load becomes relatively complicated. If it's not conditioned, if the basement is an unconditioned space, Am I going to want to run water lines any place in this area under that porch? Probably not, because it's going to freeze. Okay, so all of this takes into account. That's why the first thing I do when I walk up to a house that I'm going to have to take a heat load of, before I even go into the house, and I religiously do this, I meet the customer on the front porch, okay, do my introductions, and then the first thing I do is either with or without the customer, I walk entirely around the house. I'll snap a few pictures so that when I'm in the house doing room by room, I have an idea of what I'm looking for on the inside. Okay, I know some people who never walk around the outside of a house, and that's a bad thing. Okay, every call I go on, I do walk around the house because of the fact that you're going to see things that you won't see from the inside. It's called the observations. Talk to me about this one. What are the, some of the things you'll have to take into consideration when you're doing your heat load? Skylight. Yup, skylights. Okay, what about, what else are you going to have to take into account? The shape of the ceiling. The shape of the ceiling, because your wall area has a partial triangle up here. So you have your wall height here, but then you're going to have a partial triangle. That's what my master bedroom is, just like that. Okay, so you're probably, when you take a look at your net wall area, okay, you're going to have to do two measurements. You're going to do the measurement under there, which I call the knee wall sort of thing. Uh -huh. And then you're going to have to do the height here. Oh, son of a bitch. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, in your case, I would not count this as wall area. This is ceiling area. Right. Okay. This wall becomes very easy. There's no windows there. Okay, and again, if you've already submitted, don't resubmit. Just fix your copy so that you, you're more accurate when you're done, okay? I didn't even do my second floor. Okay, yeah, then don't worry about it. But I wanted to, yeah, if somebody did something and did find something else when we're going through this, don't resubmit. Just fix it on your end. Okay. Okay, so, okay, three skylights of pitch ceilings. What did I say about insulation up here on cathedral ceilings? That's going to be my question. The insulation there is going to be different because you don't have a lot of space there. 
You don't have a ton of space, and you don't really know what's in here. You're going to be able to guess that there's insulation there. But remember I said, if you go out to a house that's having heating and cooling problems, and they have a cathedral ceiling, you really don't know what the builder has put in there. You can guess it's the rest, same as the rest of the house, like R19 or something like that. But you can't 100% be sure, unless you can see it from the attic. Okay. So you, can you put some uh, returns in that area over there? In this ceiling? No, in the like in the room, like like in the room. Depending yeah. on a lot of times, this wall over here has a space behind it, has attic space behind it, or the wall that we can't see on this side. So I can a lot of times put ductwork into the side walls. Okay. Oh, uh, does that make sense? Yep. Okay, can I I would never put ductwork into this outside wall because again, ductwork in outside walls breaks insulation and it's just not a good idea. But I could put ductwork if I have space behind one of these walls. A lot of times I can connect to the attic of the rest of the house or I have a drop where I can get through a space someplace to the basement. These houses sometimes are a pain to duck because a lot of times, in a lot of these houses, um, if it's not new construction, this has been an add-on where someone took an attic space, made of raised the roof a little bit, put in that additional three-foot wall, and built the bedroom out of there. Um, a lot of the old Cape Cod-style houses have this sort of setup where a room has been added. And it, it is a problem sometimes to run ductwork. You might have to re-inherit a closet or something like that. Okay, um, one more. What are the, some of the things you'd want to take into account here? The fireplace? I'm absolutely going to take the fireplace into account. What else? The porch? The French doors. Yeah. The French cool. doors and the windows going to the porch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very large, um, very large glass area here. Now again, if this is that porch we were looking at on the other house, and I don't know if it is or not, okay. Do I have some shading on those windows? Yeah. Okay. What about the different types of building materials here on these outside wall on these walls? Okay, I mean I have sheetrock here. Okay, my guess based on the, all of this other construction is that the outside of that wall is brick. The outside of this is brick. Okay, the floor is wood floor. Okay, which makes you take into account when we're talking about an un, unheated basement. There's a lot of different building materials in here. So are you going to take a measurement of every single one of these different building materials, or are you going to use an average? Like most of it is sheetrock. Use an average. Yeah, honestly, I'm not. I'm not a mechanical engineer. I'm looking for as close as I can possibly get, having a little bit of wood here down at the bottom over sheetrock is for a baseboard is not going to make a difference in the grand scheme of things. Okay? So again, we're going to we're going to use what the majority of the construction is. Okay, so basically they're listing on the answers you guys got them all. They're listing on the French door leading to the patio or other three season room. We're talking about the large windows. We're talking about the fireplace, and we're talking about the variations of construction material. Okay, do not leave just because I'm closing my PowerPoint. Don't hop off the session. There's one other thing I really want to show you guys real quick, and then we'll wrap it up. But I, I, got, have one I, got, other... I got a question. Um, sure. Windows, now, for example, um, um, this, uh, this, this company, they have a window now. They have like a gas inside of the window. And uh, you know the filtration of, of, of heat or, or cold is very very minimum. That count too. You have to, yeah, because you'll still have you'll still have solar gain. Your U value might be excellent, 
But if the sun hits those direct, hits those windows exactly right, we still have to count them as windows. But when you look at your, when you look at the window chart, and let's see if I can pull that up real quick. When you look at your window chart, okay. Um, let me find the one. Okay. We have a double, um, we have a double pane window, okay? You're going to be looking at the low emittance glass, okay? That takes into account that interior airspace that's either filled with gas or air. Okay. Yeah, because um, Anderson Windows, I believe, is the company. Yeah. They use they use a gla uh, the glass inside the glass. They have a gas, and then they use like compound of plastic and wood in the frame. Yep. So you're going to be using you're going to be using um, basically the E, okay, which is the T I M. Unless you find something that looks better, okay, what you'll that use stand? that. T I M. Okay, now they do have some. Um, they do have some on these charts if you go through them further, and I'm not going to scroll through them right now. But they do have some showing plastic frames. Okay, as you go through. Do you know what TIM stands for? Honestly, no. I'll still, I'll look it up and I'll get back to you guys on that one. That's one of those I got to go look up on. Oh yeah, because I see that a lot on there. Yeah, I'll I'll look that up and I'll either put it in I'll either put it in the announcement post or I'll get back to you on it tomorrow with that, okay? All right, thank you. Yeah. I'd rather say I don't know than to guess that I do. So that one I got to go look at. Okay, now um again, they give you the option here to have the storm windows, but that isn't really what I want to show you. Let me log into let me open up the Simutex system real quick. Um, you guys have access to this, okay? This is the one that I did the video on and said, please load sometime before next term, okay? Um, so you guys have access to this. On the Simutex system, there is a right suite universal. It's sort of the little globe with the shortcut. Okay, and we run it as a demo because honestly, WriteSoft is relatively expensive and they don't give a, they won't let me have an educational license. So you run it as a demo, which isn't bad. The only thing you can't change is you can't change like the contractor name and stuff like that. But um, WriteSoft is actually a really neat software that actually lets you do all of your buildings and everything. Um, let me, I want to get my drawing. Um, okay, it actually lets you draw out a building. Okay, just by, if I want to add a room. Okay, by the way, this is the left side of my house. Okay, I was playing around with this to try to um, so I could show you something. If I want to add a room, all I do is click over there on the room shapes. I add the room. Again, if you look at it when I was dragging these things around, let me get to a point. Okay. It actually, like, gives me the dimensions. So if I add another room, let me get this down to about where it should be. If I come over here, I add a room. See the dimensions come up right there? And you can just drag and drop and add the rooms. Then if you have a doorway between two room areas, you click on the door, you add the length of the door, and then you can say what type of door it is. In this case, it's just a wall opening. You click off of it and you have the wall opening. Okay, so right soft is what most contractors that have sort of gone up in the centuries, okay, some guys still use paper, pencil, some guys use um, use the just the Excel spreadsheet, but WriteSoft allows you to just come through 
and say, okay, I have a room, here's my dimensions, let's right away draw it onto the house. This happens to be kitchen, okay, this happens to be dining room. And then I know that I can put my window, window right there, because, you know, everyone has a sink with the window over the sink. Okay. And if I really want to be picky, I'll get it centered. If I want to change the type of the window, click on it, go to the properties, and I can actually look up and see exactly what type of window it is frame material. This is what you, you were talking about, about the reinforced plastic with the plastic and wood combination. Could be reinforced vinyl. Do I have storm windows? What's my gap between the two? Does it have reflective performance? What it's filled with would be like the Argon, which is the Anderson windows. Okay, this one lets you get a lot more. This one, basically, you're doing the charts and the tables directly from the pop-ups. Okay, then I have over here in the back, okay, I have a much bigger window area. Again, what type of windows are we talking about? It's filled with argon, um, clear, operable, reinforced vinyl, no storm because there isn't a need for it. Okay, so again, all of this. Now, I've showed you guys the Excel spreadsheet. Okay, if I wanted to look at it in that view, which by the way is the view I would turn into the building department, I would click over here and everything on that Excel spreadsheet that we're looking at is automatically being done based on my um, drawing on WriteSoft. Sort of neat, isn't it? Okay, so again, if we were in a true design, if we were doing a long, like if I were t if I were doing a design course for a bunch of mechanical engineers or people who are actually do going, and this is all they're going to be doing for a living, this WriteSoft product would be the central of my design course. It is out there for any of you guys who want to play around with it. I'm not saying by any means whatsoever I expect you guys to be experts on this. But it is out there if you guys want to play around with it. You can actually save your drawings. Just come up here, click Save, give it a name. Okay, if it's already there, it's going to want to replace it. Try to put your initials in the name. Okay, so somebody else doesn't overwrite you. And it's, it's all there. And again, I gave you video directions on how to get into this. This was the one I wanted you to do the, um, I wanted you to go through and, um, basically install RDP on your um, iPads and stuff like that, but WriteSoft is out there. Um, what we're going to be using a lot over the upcoming term is there's some air conditioning simulation out here. Okay, um, great for troubleshooting. This, this saved me a lot when I went first went into the field. And some other stuff like that, that's why I want you to have access to it. But WriteSoft is right there. When you click on it to open it, run it as a demo. If you've previously designed, if you've had a file that you opened before and you want to get back into it, just come over to File, Open, and you have to select a demo file because, again, it's, it's the demo file. So that's the WriteSoft product. I will probably be going in and out of this WriteSoft product um, on and off as we go through as we go through the rest of this course because it's easier for me to show you ductwork layout and stuff like that on that. So what I owe you guys by the end of the day is I owe you um, I need to get you guys that spreadsheet that can be opened on your iPad. Again, I started working on it this morning. Um, yesterday was not a good day, so I really had some problems getting some stuff done yesterday. So this morning I'm giving you guys I'll get I'll finish that Excel spreadsheet while I have some meetings today. I'll upload that near the videos, and I'll also get you that definition of TIM, okay? Um, i got to go look that up and figure out what that is. Um, I know it's the high-efficiency frames, but I want to go figure it out. 
Okay, and I think that's what about I owe you, and I think we're through our time for the night, day. So let me turn the video, let me turn the recording off, and if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them.